What do you want to be when you grow up? It's a question we've all faced in our lives at some time or another. This time, I am three years old. I look up, almost defiant, my trusty cardboard box space helmet tucked under my arm. <laughs> Grandma, I say, when I grow up, I'm going to be a doctor and an astronaut at the same time. Shortly after this, aged four, I visited Kennedy Space Center in Florida. I had the chance to ask a question of shuttle astronaut Mark Lee. To me, this man is a superhero, so I ask him the only question my four-year-old child brain can fathom. What happens if you throw up in space? <laughs> I guess you could say that even then, I was fascinated by how we're going to live, survive, and thrive in space. And if you're interested, it kind of forms a sphere and you have to catch it in a bag, <laughs> like a game of zero-gravity high-stakes scoop ball. <laughs> when I was 15, my high school physics teacher reignited my love for space and changed the path of my professional life. She turned off all the lights in our classroom and sat and told my whole class the story of the beginning of the universe. I fell in love with the idea of space and space exploration all over again, and I knew that I had to work in exploring the stars. My goal was to go to medical school. and At this time, I didn't know how to combine these two great passions that I had. NASA didn't hire doctors, did they? Turns out, they did. And in 2016, aviation and space medicine became a fully recognized medical specialty here in the UK. Just before leaving high school, I reached out to Dr. Bonnie Posselt, one of this specialty's first trainees, who has since become my mentor and trusted friend. I knew that I had to do everything I could to find out about this amazing field. Now, I'm a space physiology master's student, having completed the first three years of medical school here at King's. And once I finish, I plan to specialize in space medicine. Space medicine, projects, and conferences have taken me all over the world. I've met some of the greatest minds in the space arena, and some of the best friends I'll ever have. I'm here with you now to tell you some of the best bits of what I've learned in the hope that you find it just as exciting as I do. Our bodies are perfectly adapted to life on Earth in normal gravity. We've evolved over millions of years to be perfectly suited to our environment. So when you take a human body out of this home that it's so accustomed to and place it, say, on the International Space Station, issues start to arise. One of the biggest challenges in space medicine is the lack of the effect of gravity, which causes several changes in your body. In space, your back stretches out, meaning I would go to from the roughly five foot eight that you see in front of you up to maybe five foot 10. This doesn't last for long though, as you return to your normal height when you come back down to earth. So I'm sorry to any shorter members of the audience who might have been thinking this was a quick fix. Fluids in the lower part of your body that are generally held down by gravity start to drift upwards. This causes your legs to look thinner, and astronauts often feel that their faces are puffy or full of cold in their first few days in space. Scientists have very imaginatively named this condition puffy face chicken leg syndrome. <laughs> no, really. <laughs> space, microgravity, and these fluids shifting result in an increased pressure inside your skull meaning that your eyeballs go from the round shape that they usually are to being more flat. This affects your vision. And astronauts are actually sent to space with reading glasses to try and counteract this. And their vision gets worse the longer they're up there. This is a topic of a huge amount of research in the space medicine community to try and make changes now to negate this problem in the future. Another potential problem is that we are so accustomed to life on Earth and normal gravity that our brains aren't wired to understand nonverbal cues such as facial expressions when you're upside down, because why would you ever need to do that? There's now a rule on the International Space Station that when astronauts are floating around and working, they have to be the same way up to have a conversation. This lesson has been learned because more than a few arguments have been started because they've misread each other's facial expressions when one of them has been inverted. On Earth, your bones and muscles have to work to keep your body upright against gravity. In space, 
they don't have to do this. So you lose bone and muscle mass through this process called unloading. To counteract this, astronauts exercise for up to two hours a day just to maintain the level of strength and fitness that they had when they were on Earth. Two hours is a really long time if you think about it, especially considering the fact that these people have a to-do list that's as long as your arm. But when we look forward to going to Mars, room in the capsule is going to be at a premium, and the equipment that we use at the moment is far too bulky, limiting what we'll be able to take with us on the roughly six-month journey to the Red Planet. That six-month journey isn't without its own risks either. On the way, those pioneering astronauts will be exposed to a huge amount of radiation coming from the sun. Where we are now, the atmosphere, a thin barrier of gas surrounding the planet and the so-called ozone layer, deflect and absorb a large portion of this radiation, keeping us relatively safe. It doesn't block all of it, which is why some ultraviolet rays can still get through and cause problems such as sunburn, but we're reasonably well protected where we are now. But those astronauts on the way to Mars will be exposed to almost 60% of the maximum dose of radiation for a lifetime in just six months. This means we have to work out how to shield them. There's some discussion that a thin layer of water running between the two walls of the spacecraft might be enough to block a large portion of this radiation's damage. But water is surprisingly heavy so we need to do more research into a practical way to protect against space's greatest danger. Living long term on the Moon or Mars will present a unique set of challenges for infrastructure as well as for us as people. Previously, the longest stay on the Moon has only lasted a few days, so we don't know the effects of living in lower gravity long term. The gravity on the Moon is roughly one-sixth of what it is on Earth, meaning that you hop or skip around rather than walking. This will change how we live, move and work in space. Imagine the day job that you do, but on the Moon. Travelling there and back by Moon buggy, not able to go outside without a spacesuit on, and having to skip or jump rather than walking. Babies born on the Moon would develop differently, possibly even hopping like frogs rather than learning to walk. While this isn't proven, they would definitely suffer issues with their bone density and these space-born babies would find it very difficult, if not impossible, to adapt to life on Earth should they come back for a visit. Living in space isn't just a purely physical challenge either. There are psychological and emotional challenges as well. Imagine being able to lift up your thumb and obscure the entire Earth. Humankind gone, just like that. You wouldn't want to be removed from humanity like that, would you? Chances are these astronauts won't either, so we have to consider the emotional support that they will need for their psychological well-being. There's also likely to be a huge shortage of resources, especially on Mars. At the moment, it's estimated that it will cost about $1.3 million to launch a single kilogram of material to Mars. That's equivalent to a 70-kilogram human costing $90 million. You'd hardly drink a glass of water if you knew that it cost thousands to get to you, would you? Every ounce of resources becomes infinitely more precious the further we go from Earth. There's a branch of research called in situ resource utilization. I know that phrase is a little bit of a mouthful, so I'm going to say it again. <laughs> in situ resource utilization focuses on using the materials that we find on the surface of the moon or Mars and utilizing them for agriculture, building, manufacturing, and other purposes. Think about it. If someone becomes ill on Mars and requires hospital care, we have to find a way to synthesize the drugs that we need while we're there, because relying on resupply missions from Earth simply isn't sustainable. Building what we need while we're there will allow us to live more autonomously in space, without having to rely on resources launched from Earth. This autonomous civilization will also teach us how to recycle and deal with our waste more efficiently, and these lessons can be applied to the man-made climate issues that we face here on Earth today. 
living well on Mars will teach us to live well on Earth. Now, one of the most common questions that people ask me when I tell them what I want to do is, can I go to space then? Currently, almost every person who has been to space has been a fit, healthy, adult male. Just over 10% of the people who have ever been to space are women, and even fewer had health conditions. This means we have very little information on what happens to sick people in space or women's health problems in space. Many female astronauts take contraception for the entire duration of their mission because the waste disposal unit isn't designed for them to safely and hygienically have periods in space. And what happens to those babies that I talked about before? Will they be born healthy and able to survive? Can you even be pregnant in space? We don't know. There's so much research that we still need to do, and yet we're severely limited. Ethically, we can't and don't want to send babies or pregnant people to space. And we never want to put people at risk for the sake of our own research. But can we really accept the fact that the first time we might see the risk of childbirth in space is when we're living there for real? Researchers are finally starting to solve women's health problems in space. That is why I applaud the new emergence of people, mostly women, specialising in space gynaecology and women's health issues related to spaceflight. There's still a massive underrepresentation of females in the space industry, and while this trend is slowly shifting, we are by no means there yet. A conference is still considered diverse if just 40% of its speakers are women. And I'm hoping that we are starting to prove that the future really is female. And with NASA planning to put the first woman on the moon by 2024, that might be one small step for a woman, but it's a giant leap for womankind. I am part of a wonderful research team of graduate students from across London, and we are trying to find out what happens to the everyday person who wants to go to space. We have designed pre-flight medical checks required for commercial suborbital space flight. And it's been amazing to get stuck in alongside some of the best people I know. But the best part isn't working on something I love with people that I'm lucky enough to call friends. The best part is my research team is a rarity in that we are all female. We are the Parabola Ladies, four young women who are hoping to change the way that space medicine is taught and portrayed to doctors and spaceflight passengers alike. But to bring you back, remember that four-year-old girl at Kennedy Space Center meeting her superhero? Here she is at 21 with that same astronaut as part of the Space Symposium in Colorado, one of the biggest conferences in the world for people studying and working in the space industry. I hope I've given you some insight into my exciting world and some of the challenges that we still need to overcome to safely and responsibly move forward to new worlds. I intend to be part of a team that helps to put people on Mars. But while we're still here on Earth, I want to make sure that no one is forgotten. I want to make sure that we always remember the female perspective and how our journeys might affect the women who undertake them. And lastly, I want to make sure that I always stay faithful to those big dreams of that little girl. Thank you very much for listening.